You know, every time the body of Christ gathers together, it is a celebration of the risen Lord. Jesus said, where two of us gather, just two of us, he will be in our midst. So every time Christians get together, we celebrate the resurrection. Every time we meet together, we're celebrating that Christ is alive. It is this truth that is the central doctrine of our faith. It's the most important event in human history. It's the most cherished hope of my life. And I'm sure it's the most cherished hope of your life as well. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our faith is futile. And the promise of eternity is empty and we're fooling ourselves. But with the resurrection, and since Christ did indeed rise from the grave, then not only are his claims accurate, but his promises are true and the hope we have is meaningful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that Christians once again need to embrace the power of the resurrection. We have gotten a little too complacent. We need a fresh encounter with the living Christ. I, I've noticed in my own heart, in my own life, I have sensed a stirring in my spirit uh, that, the Lord is, that the Lord is drawing me to him. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a task, in a job in which you do a lot of things for the Lord. Hopefully they're for the Lord, uh, like, like many of you. But I'm sensing the Lord drawing me to him, to his person, because he is alive. Uh, how many of you are sensing that in your own spirit, that the Lord is just kind of drawing you back to himself a little bit? You know, there's a promise that goes with this. The 107th Psalm says this, he satisfies the longing soul. And he fills the hungry soul with goodness. This morning, I want us to consider a soul who was very weary and very thirsty and very hungry at the same time. One could even say that he was desperate, he was heartbroken, he was longing for the Lord to meet with him. I want us to consider the Apostle Thomas today and how a confrontation with the risen Christ and the wounds of that risen Christ quenched his thirst and satisfied his hunger forever. I want us to accept the Lord's invitation to come near for a few minutes. And so in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning in the 24th verse, it says, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. This is after his resurrection. The Bible says they told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it. Say this with me. Faith is a choice. He didn't say, I can't believe it. He said, I won't believe it. I won't believe it. Unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. This time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Don't you love the way the Lord does stuff? Peace be with all of you. Thomas, come here. <laughs> Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy, your kindness, and your graciousness. We thank you, Lord, for the risen Christ. I pray that today, as we've gathered here to celebrate your goodness, 
There may be some in this house who are struggling with what they believe and what they don't believe. There are some, Lord God, who feel like they can't, others who feel like they won't. I ask in the name of Jesus that the great power of your word, not my preaching, but your word, would penetrate their hearts. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would give each of us a fresh revelation of the risen Christ. I pray, Father, that the mountains we face, the mountains of sin, the mountains of difficulty, the mountains of sickness, the mountains of trial and tribulation, would all take their rightful place below Christ, and that we would see you high and lifted up. So help us today, I ask. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And for all this, I thank you in Jesus' sacred name. And those who agreed said together, Amen. Verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. You know, faith is by its very nature and definition a challenge for us. It just is. I don't have to believe for what I see. I don't have to believe for what I feel. Or hold. I don't have to believe for what I taste or hear necessarily. But I do have to believe for things that are unseen. And things that might be unknown to my natural eye. That which is already apprehended requires no faith. Therefore, the notion that one can be cavalier about the concepts as vastly important as life and death and eternity. The nature of God. What happens when you die? Those who are just kind of dismissive of those concerns of other people just really haven't given much thought to it. Nor have they experienced the heights of glory or the depths of pain either. They just haven't lived very much. But those of us that have lived through some things, those of us that have experienced some things and given some thought to some things, find that not only is faith reinforced, but the more it's reinforced, the deeper the challenge of it also becomes. The Apostle John, in his gospel in particular, records several instances in which the faith of individuals is challenged. Not just the Pharisees, not just the, the, those that we would consider unbelievers, but the faith of those who would inquire of and try very hard and desperately to follow Jesus. In chapter 3, we read of Nicodemus, who comes to the Lord at night and under, tries to understand the concepts of rebirth and being born again and born of the Spirit, and he's wrestling with these, with these issues. In chapter 6, a large number of believers stop following Jesus, so much so that Jesus finally looks at the 12 and says, do you want to leave also? We have this kind of flannel graph Jesus picture you know, and it's Easter bunnies and lilies and roses and everybody loving everything he's saying. Most people didn't like what he was saying. Most people didn't appreciate what he was saying. And finally, when Jesus looks at the 12 and he says, do you want to leave also? It's the apostle Peter in, in, in John 6, verse 68, who speaks up for the 12 and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That's a statement of faith. Peter didn't say, Lord, I'm understanding everything you're saying. I get all that you're doing. Oh, Lord, you're without controversy. No, he just said, Lord, there's no other game in town. You're it. So faith is something that challenges us. When Mary and Martha experienced the death of their brother, Jesus' dear friend, Lazarus, in chapter 11, he looked at them and he says, do you believe? Do you believe? Therefore, it's not surprising at all that John would summarize the purpose of his writing of the gospel so that you and I, those who would read his book, would have the ability and the wherewithal to believe, or at least to make a choice to believe. Because faith is a decision, not an emotion. It is not simply the absence of doubt. Any more than courage would be the absence of fear. My father fought in war. He told me, courage isn't, not, isn't walking into battle unafraid, you're afraid. It's choosing 
to go anyway. Faith is not this simple thing that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have all my doubts eliminated. I'm not going to have any concerns whatsoever. No, 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 no. Faith is saying I'm choosing to trust the promises of God. No matter what I see, no matter what I face. Faith is not irrational. It is transrational. Faith is not blind, it is wide-eyed. Faith is not mind over matter, it is believing in spite of. Faith is not the failings of a simple mind. The world would try to talk about people of faith as though our minds were less complicated. In fact, I would say just the opposite. We do not need to check our brains in at the door. But we do have to believe. This brings us to someone who's gotten a lot of bad press for 2,000 years. That's the Apostle Thomas. I'm going to stand here today and defend Thomas for a few minutes, okay? A lot of people say, oh, I relate to the Apostle Peter. I don't. Not as much. Peter was a lot bolder than I am. That may surprise some of you, but Peter was a lot bolder than I am. I don't really relate to the Apostle John either. John was just so in love with Jesus that it was, it was amazing. I mean, John, John's, John's up there with me. I, I, boy, that, that's what a Christian looks like, okay? Thomas I can relate to a little bit. Thomas was the guy who needed facts. Anybody else like that? Thomas was the guy who needed examination. Thomas was the guy who processed faith. Thomas was the guy who needed to evaluate the current situation. Thomas was the guy that that needed some analytical assessment of what was going on. Now listen, we find this out that Thomas, in our text, he's been hanging out with the 12 for eight days. Okay? He didn't bail. He didn't run. He didn't take off. He didn't betray the Lord like Peter, but he didn't follow the Lord to the cross either like John. But Thomas was there. Thomas wanted some proof. And by the way, Thomas wasn't really doubting Jesus as much as he was doubting those other guys. Because nine of those other guys had bailed. Peter had denied the Lord. Eight of the others, just like Thomas, had taken off. Judas had betrayed the Lord. John was the only guy that followed the Lord all the way to the cross. So when all of those guys came to Thomas and said, we've seen the Lord, you can't blame Thomas for going, yeah, I'm not so sure about you. I don't have so much doubt that I'm bailing on you guys. I'm going to stick around for a while, but you know what? I need proof. And your word just isn't enough for me today. I need Jesus to come to me. Now, is there doubt in that? Yeah, there's doubt in that. He wants rational, logical, evidentiary truth. He needs convincing proof that the same Jesus who did the miracles that he saw, the same Jesus who broke the bread just over a little week earlier, the same Jesus who went to the cross, the same Jesus who suffered and died, the same Jesus wasn't a figment of his friend's imagination, the same Jesus who wasn't a a, a ghost, the same Jesus that it wasn't that they all had a collective vision of the risen Lord. He wanted to know that Christ had come out of the tomb. And it's then that suddenly, verse 26, Jesus is standing among them and it says, peace be with you. As he did the week earlier, Jesus suddenly appears and brings the wonderful greeting of peace. But then he looks at Thomas and he says, come here. There is something profound in my estimation of the manner in which John presents the risen Lord here. Because he speaks of Thomas's need. He's not, he's not, you know, he's not bailing on Thomas. He's not throwing Thomas under the proverbial bus. What do you, what, what the, some people say, what the, the, the younger people say, he's not putting Thomas on blast, you know, or 
or whatever that is. I'm not even sure what that is, but I've heard it said. <laughs> I mean, how would you like your doubts aired for 2,000 years? How would you like your little failure, your little moment where you didn't believe aired for everybody? 2,000 years, people are going to be reading about it. When you get to heaven, they're going to look at you and go, oh, you're that guy. Okay. <laughs> So John doesn't do this to make Thomas look bad. He does this because he wants all the Thomases in the world to recognize just how merciful God is. Amen. That God will meet you. He will find you. He will call you out. And when you don't think he's heard your doubt, he has heard your doubt. And your doubt hasn't frightened him. Your doubt hasn't made him run away. Now what he's done is he's going to make you wait eight days. Not showing up the minute you decide you must show up like I want you to. No, no, no. But he will show up. He will intersect your life. He will come into your doubt. He will come into your fear. He will come into your analysis. He will meet you at a moment and a time in which you cannot run away and hide. And he will call you by name. Come here. But the other thing that's profound about the way John presents our Savior is he demonstrates the Savior's wounds. You see... When I think of the risen Lord, I tend to think of this glory. I tend to think of the majesty, the might, the splendor, the power, the Revelation 1 unveiling of Jesus. And that's true. But when the gospel presents the risen Lord as he appears to his disciples, he takes great care in demonstrating the wound. You see, my friends, this day is so important because it's Resurrection Sunday. But you don't have Resurrection Sunday without Good Friday. You don't have the glory of the resurrection without the terror of the crucifixion. And the only thing that makes the Good Friday good is Resurrection Sunday. You see, they all go together. There's a symbiotic relationship. His death doesn't have power if he doesn't rise. And his resurrection is important because he died. And so the wounds of the resurrected Christ are important because, number one in your notes, we recognize him by his wounds. We recognize him by his nail-scarred hand. We recognize him by his pierced feet. We recognize him. They will look upon the one they have pierced. The wounds of the Savior are so profoundly important. Think about this, my friends. When the Lord identifies himself, his self-identity, he does not identify himself by his glory. He does not identify himself by his overt power. He does not identify himself by angelic announcement. Oh, there was a choir of angels that sang when he was born. And there were angels at the empty tomb that said he's not here. He is risen. But when the Lord shows up, he identifies by, look, it's me. Look, it's me. Put your finger here. Examine my hands. Extend your hand and put it in my side. Do not continue in your unbelief, but believe. This is how the prophet said we would recognize the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were punishment from God. A punishment for his own sins. Hallelujah. But he was pierced for our rebellion. Crushed for our sins. Beaten so we could be whole. And whipped so we could be healed. See... Had I been the Lord? Oh, had I been the Lord? I wouldn't be showing up to those guys. I'd be knocking on Pilate's door. 
how you like me now? <laughs> I'd have been visiting Caiaphas's house. I'd have been talking to the whole Sanhedrin. That's me. That's why you guys all need to be glad I'm not the Lord. But I mean, that would have been me. I'd have gone to everybody, all those people wagging their heads, all those people crucifying me. How about the soldier that brought the hammer down? Oh, I'd be going to his house. Not the Lord. Not the Lord. He does not self-identify in glorious power. That day will come. There will come a day when he returns. There will come a day when every eye will see him. There will come a day when all heaven and all hell will be broken and all the powers of hell will be tossed asunder. That day's coming. But right now, how the Lord is recognized is by his wounds. The suffering servant. The Lamb of God. John 1, 29, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Revelation 13, 8, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Nicholas Walterstorff, the uh, uh, philosophy professor at Yale, Christian philosophy, said this, The wounds of Christ are his identity. They tell us who he is. He did not lose them. They went down into the grave with him and they came up with him, visible, tangible, palpable. Rising did not remove them. He who broke the bonds of death kept his wounds. Why? John said in Revelation, I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one seated on the throne. It was written on both sides, fastened with seven seals. I also saw a powerful angel coming out in a voice like thunder. Is there anyone who can open the scroll, who can break its seals? There was no one, no one in heaven, no one on earth, no one from the underworld able to break open the scroll and read it. I wept and wept and wept that no one was found able to open the scroll, able to read it. One of the elders said, don't weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David's tree has conquered. He can open the scroll. He can rip through the seven seals. So I looked and there, surrounded by the throne, animals and elders, was a lamb. The elder said, it's the lion of the tribe of Judah. But John said, when I looked, it was the lamb. Slaughtered, yet standing tall. Oh, hallelujah, my friends. Hallelujah, my friends. What a savior you have. The lamb slaughtered, but standing tall. Slaughtered, but standing tall. Death could not hold him. The grave could not contain him. Slaughtered for my sin and your sin. Bearing the marks of my transgression. Bearing the marks of my hatred. Bearing the marks of my wickedness. And forever bearing the, call, the scars of my sin. But standing tall. Hallelujah. Overcoming all. Hallelujah. Forever he will be. The lamb. Wherever he will be, the lamb. We will recognize him. Oh, my friends, don't you understand? When you get there, when you look in heaven, there'll be the glory of angels. There'll be mighty Michael. There'll be powerful Gabriel. There'll be the heavenly choir. There'll be the great apostles. There'll be the great judges. There'll be the great patriarchs. Moses will be there. Elijah will be there. Elisha will be there. The apostles will be there. But none of them will have the wounds. Hallelujah. Only Jesus will bear the wounds of your salvation. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So when Jesus self-identifies, he says to Thomas, look, look, we recognize him by his wounds. Number two, we receive him through his wounds. The Lord says to Thomas, Thomas, come near. Reach out, touch, see, put your hand here. Thomas, it's my wounds that compel you to believe. I bear the marks. I bear the suffering. I bear the brokenness of humanity. This perfect being 
God incarnated. I bear those marks. For you, Thomas. For you. You wanted to touch them, touch them. You needed to see them, behold them. You needed to witness it, witness it. I bear it for you. Have you ever noticed how important it is for us to touch? It's terribly important. I had the privilege of going with my youngest son, Christopher, to the Smithsonian Air Museum. They have the Wright Brothers plane there. The Wright Brothers plane. Now, see, I love history. I'm the kind of guy that, I, you know, if I'm at Stonehenge, I want to sneak across and touch the stone. Okay? So the Wright Brothers plane was right there. Little velvet rope right there. Right there, the wing. I could reach it right there. I looked at Christopher. I said, I want to touch it. I need to touch it. Now, see, I was raised, some of you know my mom, I was raised by a German mom. You will not touch it. <laughs> you will obey the rules. Some of you remember Rhonda. Chris was raised by Rhonda. <laughs> so Chris looked at me and goes, touch it. <laughs> Go on. It's almost like the little cartoons, a good, good and a bad on our shoulders, you know. Everything in me is saying, I need to touch this. And then, but, but, but my mother's voice is saying, don't you touch it. There might be guys fly out of the ceiling if you do. So Christopher looks at me and goes. <laughs> Nothing happened, Dad. I'm still here. Touch it. <laughs> so I went. Kind of waited for people to leave the room, look around. <laughs> it was almost mystical. Just because I'd read that one of my first books ever reading was about flight and the Wright brothers, because my dad was in the Air Force. And to touch that historical thing. Now they're probably going to show up now that this is live streamed. I just thought of that. <laughs> Here they come. If I'm not here next week, you know what happened. <laughs> but we need that, don't we? My friends, can you imagine what that moment was? Hallelujah. When Thomas reached out and he touched him, he touched the risen Christ, it wasn't sort of magical. It would have been powerful. It would have been emotive. It would have been visible. It would have been glorious. It would have been significant because he touched Jesus. Oh, beloved, there's going to come a day. There's going to come a time when not only every eye will see him, but there'll come a time when you will touch him. There'll come a time when you embrace him. There'll come a time when you look at that wound and you see that scar and you will hold on and grasp him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We receive him because of his wounds. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his stripes, we're healed. Oh, you don't have to wait till heaven, by the way. You don't have to wait till glory, by the way. You can touch him today. He bore all of our sin. He bore all of our sickness. He bore all of our shame. He bore all of our sorrow. His suffering is our suffering. His wounds are our wounds. His death is our death. His burial is our burial. And his resurrection is our resurrection. Hallelujah. We rise because he is risen. Oh, my friends, there are times. Please don't take this wrong. I love the glorious heavenly seated Christ. But there are times the suffering, wounded, 
Lamb of God means more to me than I can begin to imagine. There have been times in my life when darkness surrounded me. There have been times in my life when I've been blinded by my own sin. There have been times in my life I've been blinded by my own rebellion. There have been times I've been blinded by my own failure. There have been times I've been blinded by my own grief. There have been times I've been blinded by my own pain. There have been times I felt like I was groping about. And I could not see. I could not behold. I could not find him. And he found me. And in those times, I, those desperate hours, like, like, like with Thomas, Christ came near to me. And Christ reached out his hand. And I knew I was touched by the nail-scarred hand. I knew I was touched by his wounds. I knew that he met me where I was. No wonder Watts would write. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did ever such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown? Oh, the wonderful cross! Oh, the wonderful cross! It bids me come and die, and there I find that I may truly live. This is the Christ who would say, even if I make my bed in hell, David said, behold, you're there. I know because of his wounds, he can and will meet me anywhere. Isaiah 49 said, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you see I have engraved you on the palms of my hands you say why would the risen Christ keep the scars because they're your scars we're going to this table to remind us of him Not that omniscience needs reminding, but his scars remind him of you. I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. I will never forget you. And so because we recognize him through his wounds and we receive him because of his wounds, we must reverence him. Worship is not a duty to be paid. Worship is not a religious tenet to be walked through. Worship is not a, 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 a something that we do kind of as the warm-up for the preacher. We must reverence him. We must honor him. The word of God says that when Thomas touched the wounds of the Christ... When Thomas looked inside at the, at, the, at the face of Jesus, when Thomas beheld him, he cried out the only thing, frankly, that creation can do when it sees the risen God. My Lord and my God. Would to God that we, his people, would enter his house with that sense of reverence. Would to God that we would enter prayer with that sense of reverence. Too many times we put God on trial. Too many times we've, we've said, well, God didn't do this for me, therefore I'm going to somehow withhold my praise or withhold my worship. As though you are passively, aggressively punishing God. Are you kidding me? He is the Lord God Almighty. He owes me no explanation. He owes me nothing. And yet he comes to me. He meets me. He comes to you and he meets you. And when you have a revelation of Jesus, the only thing that's left for you to do is cry out, my Lord and my God. If that's not in your heart, if that's not in my heart, then we need to go back until his wounds mean something, until his resurrection inspires something. 
Revelation 5 says they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne of the living beings and the elders, and they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and then I heard every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea they sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever and the four living beings said amen and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the lamb oh my friends there will come a day when even the lost will be compelled to worship the Lamb. All who dwell on the earth, Revelation 13, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Those whose names have not, those whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Though he, Christ, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. Hallelujah. He took on the humble position of slave and appeared in human form and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in things in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. church needs to stop being embarrassed of your faith you need to stop being embarrassed of the lamb that took your sin you need to stop being embarrassed about what people think if you say the word Jesus or if you tell them you're going to church on Sunday or if you tell them thank God for what he's done for you quit being embarrassed quit worrying about what lost people think about that and start living a life that lets them see what being found looks like Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord has saved you. The Lord has redeemed you. The Lord has loved you. Reverence him. A tomb was sealed. And with it, it seemed all the hopes and joys of humanity were sealed and stashed away. But as the old hymn said, up from the grave he arose. And the dawning of light and the dawning of life is not only for you to live a more fulfilled life. That's not the Christian faith. Oh, yeah, you have abundant life. I'm not denying that. But Christ didn't come to make you better. He came to make you deader so that he could raise you. He came to give you his life in exchange for your life. He came to give you eternity. He didn't come just to make you more prosperous here. He didn't come so you can live a nice, healthy, happy life. All that's good and all that goes with the kingdom. Don't get me wrong. That's not what he came for. He came to give you eternity. 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 Maybe you're like Thomas today. You're here. And maybe some of the friends around you who are Christians haven't been so good to you in terms of their testimony. And there's part of you that says, I think I believe in Jesus, but I'm not so sure about the guys following him. I can understand that. I can understand that. But you're here. You're here. Maybe you're here because you wanted to, uh, you know, see, see a child in the, in the uh, song. Or maybe you're here because it's Easter and it's kind of what you do. Maybe you're here because you're meeting people that you love and then you're going to brunch or lunch or whatever they call it now. But you're here. You're here. 
And Jesus said, if two or three of us are here, he's here. So the wounded Christ is here. Right now. And he's alive. And he bears marks that remind him of you. And he's not here in condemnation. He's not here in destruction. He's not here to to overwhelm you. He's here to love you. He bids you, come, come on. Go ahead. Maybe you've been running from him. A lot of church people run from Jesus when they get where mom and dad aren't making them go to church anymore. Well, that's fine, but just remember this, God has no grandchildren. You have to make a call for God on your own. You have to surrender your life. It's not enough that mom and dad were men and women of faith, you have to be. Maybe you're like me, maybe you're like Thomas. Maybe you're waiting on the analysis to all come in. Don't wait too long. Wait too long. Don't wait too long. Today is the day. Now is the time.